Mr. Godman, how does Bhagwan's path suit the modern man? I mean, we're very stressed and busy, and there's lots of lots of paths and millions of books to read, but what about Bhagwan's path? Self-inquiry, surrendering to God or self. How does it fit our times? It's, it's timeless. The nice thing about it is that it's relevant advice for today. It would have been relevant advice 2,000 years ago. And if anyone happens to come across a crumbly old book on self-inquiry in a thousand years' time, it's, it will be relevant for them. Um, just back to Lakshmanaswamy for a minute. He used to say occasionally, the only worthy accomplishment in life is self-realization. If you don't realize the self, or, or at least if you don't even try to realize the self, then you've wasted your life. So that's a decision every person who comes across these spiritual stories, teachings has to face. Either you take them seriously, you make an attempt to transcend samsara, to get out of your endless cycle of suffering, birth and death, or you just go back to worldly life. So your, your question is, what is the role of these teachings in the modern world? It's entirely up to the person concerned. If somebody tells you this is a way that you can be peaceful, get rid of all your suffering, and you ignore it, that's your fault. It's, it's, it's your decision, it might be your destiny, but I don't think there's any cultural or time restraints on who can benefit from Bhagavan's teachings. You don't have to believe anything in order to practice them. What Bhagavan is giving you is a working hypothesis of what causes you to function as an individual, what causes you to find yourself in a state of suffering and unhappiness. And then he says, if you do this, then there's a possibility that your sense of individuality, your suffering, will end. So he's not asking you to believe in God, he's not asking you to join an organization, he's not asking you to even give up your family. He never ever permitted anyone to give up either a job or a family responsibility. He said you can tackle this problem in whatever circumstances you find yourself in. It's entirely up to you. I'm showing you the exit door, if you like. I'm showing you the one way out of this cycle of birth and death, this endless suffering. And what he was telling people was that there is a sense of individuality that makes you think, I am a person who occupies a body, I see a world external to myself, and because I have located myself and my identity inside this body, I have to choose and decide what I have to do in order to protect this bodily form. I have to function with other people who I assume have the same entities inside themselves. So you get this whole uh, continuation of protecting, identifying with a limited form and all the suffering that uh, progresses from that assumption. He's saying that your idea that you live in a body is entirely wrong, and he said you can challenge it. He said, I'm not asking you to pray to God, to believe anything, to read any books. He said, all I'm asking you to do is to look at how your own individual, individual self functions. And he said, I'll give you a hint, I'll give you a clue. He said, watch the way that your mind takes ownership of all the things that come into its purview. It sees something and it thinks, I see a cat. It remembers something and it thinks, I remember what I had for dinner yesterday. He said the common thread to all of these thoughts, ideas, is this thing called I, which you've located inside yourself, and you attach it to the memories, the thoughts, the perceptions, and that, in the same way that a, a fast-moving set of frames in a camera gives the illusion of cont continuity, this I, moment to moment, seems to create a solid entity, a solid person that you believe yourself to be inside yourself. He said you can dismantle this idea, this assumption, by taking attention off the things that 
your mind ordinarily plays with, experiences, jumps after. He said, just try to be aware of what it is inside yourself when you say I. When you say, I am happy, I am a lawyer, I am a woman, anything that I wants to associate with, go back to the fundamental thing inside yourself that's saying it. And he said, put attention on that, keep it there. He said, you, you won't be able to do it more than a fraction of a second, but every time your attention wanders, go back to it again, again, and again. And he said, sooner or later, you're, you'll find yourself getting quieter, more peaceful. You'll find you have less and less interest in extroverting your mind, your intention, your attention to external phenomena. And he said, a point will be reached when that I no longer has this urge to say, I am this, I want that, I will do this. At which point he said it can't exist in isolation by itself. That this is the key point of what Bhagavan is trying to tell people, is that your idea of being an individual person only persists because it keeps latching onto things which are not itself. If you put it in isolation, it cannot exist, and then it slowly, slowly sinks and subsides. And he said at that point it goes back into the self, back into the heart, and you have a direct experience of who you really are, instead of a false experience of who you're imagining yourself to be. Now that is a very non-religious message. It's, it's something that anybody can do. It's not something anyone can do and succeed, but it's something anyone can try to do and try for themselves to see if what he's saying about the nature of your individual self is true or not. It's entirely up to you. It's not something that you have to drop out of your worldly life to do. Uh, he would tell people who complained they were too busy that they always had some time in their day. People would say, oh, I've got this job crisis, I've got children, I've got no time for all this. And he would say, put your full attention on your job when you have to do your job. If it's a demanding job that needs your intellect, use your intellect to do your job. Don't neglect your family. Keep supporting them if it's your destiny to have one. But look at the rest of your day. You're in the bathroom, you're walking to work, you're shopping. He said there's all this spare time that you're dissipating by having your mind spin round and round. So when you go deal with your family, you're in, you're in a fractious mood. When you go to the office, your mind is not quiet. He said, put your mind in a state of silence in your spare time. So when you're out walking, waiting for your bus, he said, look at what's going on in your mind. Hold on to this sense of I, which is coordinating all your thoughts. Reject the mind's natural tendency to go out and attach itself to other things. And if you do that, he says, then you create uh, a zone of silence, a zone of peace inside yourself, in your spare time, so that when you do have to go into your living room and sort out your kids fighting, or when you're in the office having to argue with your boss, you're functioning from a place of silence and peace within yourself that communicates itself to those around you. So in no sense whatsoever was he a world rejecter. He told several people that being married, uh, having children was not an impediment to realization. He told one of his school friends, Rangan, that it's easier to realize the self as a householder than as a sannyasi, as a renunciant monk. He just said, these are your circumstances. This is the destiny that you've been given in this life. Wherever you go, you have to take your mind with you. If you run off to an ashram, you run off to a cave. You take your mind with you, you sit in your cave, and the next day your mind is creating problems for you again. He said, tackle your mind wherever you are, whatever script you've been given in this life, ex execute it calmly to the best of your ability. He said, try to be like the accountant who is in charge of the millionaire's accounts. He said, it's not the accountant's money, so he doesn't get excited by all the zeros he sees in front of him. He, he tots up the columns, he does the arithmetic right, and he goes home at night and he doesn't fantasize about all the money that he might, might have or might not have. It's not his money, it's somebody else's money. It's just his job to add up the columns and come to the right numbers. He said, have that attitude with your job. It's not ultimately my responsibility. The only worthy thing is self-realization and you have to make time for that. 
yourself. Don't give up all the things that you might think are impediments to it. Your job is not an impediment. Your family is not an impediment. If you are serious about this, then your circumstances will mould themselves into such a situation that you will find the time and have the energy to succeed.